Welcome to Unlocked, the home of common sense that speaks Britain's language. Got an action-packed episode of Brexit Unlocked today with myself and my sidekick, Captain Ben Habib. Also on the show with the Eurosceptic Roundup, there's been some juicy happenings this week in Brussels, thanks to the fact we've got the cat among the pigeons, the gorgeous Belinda de Lucy, the latest fishing news, and June Mummery is with us. And a special topic of discussion today is the EU army, um, something that we always raged against um, from all those years. David Banks, a former defence advisor to the Conservative Party and a big wig at Veterans for Britain, joins us to talk about that. We've got so much to talk about, Ben. But let's start with what a difference a week makes. Absolutely. On Brexit unlocked last week, we were giving ourselves high fives. We were almost getting the champagne out. Boris was talking tough on a no deal. We thought, wait, we were right. Yeah. And then Michael Gove. And then, well, Michael Gove pricked the bubble pretty quickly. I mean, I, I think if you want a lesson in how not to negotiate, that was it. Mm. You know, the indication from Boris Johnson was that effectively we would now be no dealing. That was the impression mm. he wanted to give the nation. And then by Tuesday, we had Michael Gove in Parliament saying that actually we're going to enforce the withdrawal agreement completely. We're going to put in mm. provision for the Northern Irish Protocol. Our EU friends, and he actually spoke, if you listen to his language, he actually spoke as if he was addressing the European Union, yeah. not that he was addressing the British Parliament. And he's, he didn't strike me as a member of our cabinet. Mm. He struck me as a supplicant of the European Union. And at, at that moment, I knew everything that Boris had done on the 15th of October was merely to get himself off the hook of that self-imposed deadline, which effectively we have now again failed to meet. It's funny because we were comparing, I know some about gas, we, we were scoring him out of 10. Darren Grimes gave him nine out of 10. June Mummery gave him an eight. You've always been a bit more cautious. You gave him a six. Yeah. What about this week? What do you think he is this week? Well, I give him a three. I, I, right. I was actually, I go lower. But Brexit Watch, of which I'm chairman, is at three. So yeah, I think yeah. I'll stick with Brexit Watch yeah. at three out of ten. Um, but but it, it it's awful, Martin, because every time you set yourself up for a gung-ho bit of action and then you fail to deliver, you don't actually go back to the position you were at before you set yourself up. You slip further. Mm. People lose more respect for you in the negotiation. You're a diminished individual in the negotiation. So he missed his 30th of June deadline, which was self-imposed. He missed the end of July, then he said September, and now he's missed the 15th of October. And what that tells me is that this government, contrary to all the bluster, all the optimism, all the banging of tables, is not prepared to leave without a deal on the 31st of December. Yeah, now I know you've been skeptical of um, Boris's will to go for a no deal all along, really. I think we all have been at Brexit Party, yeah. but we just hoped that by applying the pressure and keeping that on the table, it might happen. But I feel less optimistic this week about a no deal than I did last week, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, let's not forget that even if he were to no deal now on the future trading arrangements, we would still have the withdrawal agreement in place, mm -hmm. which would still put a border right down, would partition the United Kingdom, would still leave the EU courts in charge of state aid laws and stuff like that, which would creep into the United Kingdom completely. What Boris needed to have done was never sign that agreement in the first yeah. place. And then having signed it, he needed to have the courage to repudiate it. Yeah. And I'm afraid he is wanting. Yeah. He is desperately wanting. And it's funny because, you know, the paper was still warm when, we, when that was put on our desks in Brussels and we could tell yeah. it was a terrible treaty. And, you know, go said, you know, quite clearly, we will uphold our obligations to the withdrawal agreement. He said that on Monday and I tweeted, well, our euphoria lasted an entire weekend. You know, yeah. we, we had a weekend of feeling good and Michelle Barnier will not stop banging on about the level playing field. They're going to stand firm yeah. on that, aren't they? Yeah. they uh, Martin, they're going to stand firm on everything. Mm. And we will give them the political declaration, which just to remind you, will bind us into their state aid laws, will bind us to their competition laws, employment laws, uh, environmental laws. It'll prevent us from being able to set wholly at our own, own discretion our tax rates. Yeah. And as June will point out, it's going to bind us into some form of fixed quota share on fishing as well. And, and, and the reason I say we're going to give into the whole thing is because there's been no language from the European Union, 
no. giving ground. No. They won't give ground. Yeah, that, that, that is true. And I, I wonder if I can quickly just go to our panel and ask you guys for a score, the scores on the doors. Um, how do you think we're looking? Now, remember the question, 10 is a beautiful, clean break, national sovereignty returned. You know, we are free, we're in the clover. A zero is we are tied to HMS Merkel and we're sinking in the channel. <laughs> so, Belinda de Lucy, where do you think we are? With 10 being a beautiful Brexit, zero being a disaster. What's the scores on the doors, Belinda? Well, I think for me last week, when I was high-fiving you, Martin, after Boris's fabulous speech, um, I was probably a seven out of 10. Uh, now I think I'm more of a four. I do feel compromise UK side on level playing field and governance is on the cards with maybe a bit of our fish thrown back at us as a sweetener. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but yeah, I would say a, a, a four now. Okay, that's a four. Um, June memory, what about you? What's the score for the doors? Where are we at? Well, I'm at a three, I'm, 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 I'm even a two. I'm absolutely fed up to the back teeth of this government. You cannot get a weaker, weak isn't the word for them. I mean, you know, we talk about Boris, 186 coastal MPs. Where are they? You don't hear a dicky bird from any of them. None of them are standing up for coastal communities. They're an absolute shambles, the whole lot of them. In fact, on that cross today, I'm going to give them a one. A one. Well, that's the lowest score you've ever given, mm. June Mummery. That, that's a disappointment. It's almost cruel. A one. <laughs> Anyway, David Thanks, Banks. David, where do you think we're at? How do you think the government's doing? Give them a scores on the doors. Marks out of 10, David. Well, I think the more I find out about the withdrawal agreement, the, the more horrible it sounds. And if they're going to stick to it, then that's really bad news. And so, yeah, they've dropped considerably. I'm in the same place. I'd struggle to give them more than four or five at the moment. And uh, it, it was so different last week. Uh, but I think what we're doing actually is marking out of 10, the people who are guiding this process, who a lot of the time are the, the officials in the background instead of the ministers. And I, I'm often horrified by how ministers will say something privately or um, in previous months and years, which completely changes when something is put in front of them and is written by the officials. Mm. So that's another pessimistic score. I mean, I always keep it close to my chest and I don't give a score. I'm going three. I'm, I'm going three out of 10. I don't feel good about this. I think Boris has talked tough. I think the European Union are allowing him to appear yeah, tough. They want him to look like he's winning. Yeah and, yeah, and the press have kind of fallen for it a bit. Last week, we were revving it up, but I, I think our tactical reasons for doing that were to raise the national mood to a high. So when, if we are let down on a compromise deal, the public will be angry about it. And I, I think... That's the mood music at the moment. I'm not feeling great about Brexit then. No, I think I think it's bad. And, uh, you know, if you're away from the detail of the withdrawal agreement, like most people are, if you're away from the detail of what's going on in Westminster, you just have to ask yourself one question about this government. Why is it that Boris, who championed Brexit, allowed 136 Remain voting Conservative Party members of Parliament to stand again at the last general election when he had been run ragged by them in the previous parliament. He had to purge the Conservative Party of all the Remainers, he didn't do it. In fact, Ed Vasey, I'm gonna name him, Ed Vasey, who voted for the Ben Act and has not held nothing other than a junior ministerial position, was ennobled. I mean, what for? You know, this is not a government that's sending out signals of a commitment to a proper Brexit. This is a government, like all Conservative governments, that's trying to hold the Conservative Party together as it goes through this difficult process. And if you, if you give me one second on, on the subject, I think I, I haven't spoken in these terms before, but the difficulty in delivering Brexit is inextricably linked with the difficulties associated with the internal structure of the Conservative Party. In seeking to win elections, they appeal to all people. They seek to appeal to all people, Remainers and Brexiteers, in the case of past elections. They are therefore ridden with elements of Remain and they can't reconcile their party to Brexit. And it's because they can't reconcile their party to Brexit that it, it's irrelevant who the leader of the party is, they won't be able to de deliver it properly. Well, strong words. Well, look, for, for decades now, we've had a conversation 
about will Europe, will the European Union be the, the real moment of, 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 of sticking point for the Conservative Party? Will it make or break the Conservative Party? That could still happen. Uh, will it break them at the, at the next general election? I mean, it's a long way to the next general election. But if Brexiteers are let down, Ben, they're not going to forget that in a hurry. No. And, you know, leaving aside entirely the mess they've made of the pandemic, which is going to leave this country highly indebted with nothing to show for it on an economic basis. Mm. You know, the idea was that he was going to spend money to level up the country. And I know this is a separate subject, but we've ended up actually spending a colossal amount of money with the economy still in the doldrums, with the North being hit much harder than the South as inevitably it would happen, and with the gap between the poor and the rich going to grow. So you're going to have him having failed to deliver Brexit for the Red Wall and having economically crushed the Red Wall. Unless a new political force emerges, we better get ready for a Starmer-led government in 2024. Wow. Well, you heard it here first. Ben B thinks Starmer could beat Boris at an election. That'll get him going on the Daily Express Facebook page where they're watching now. Sorry if you just spat your tea out, but look, <laughs> I'm afraid sometimes the truth can't be sugar-coated. Ben I'm B. sorry about that, but that is how I see it. <laughs> Don't apologize for having an opinion. Right, beautiful. Now that was excellent. Get jo Join in with your comments on Facebook, on social media, you know, bang them over. We'll go through the questions next week. We'll read out some of your, your, your questions. One thing that was great about this week though, moving on now to Belinda De Lucy, was that for a moment, a joyous revolt broke out in Brussels and there were some lovely moments of Euroscepticism from some of our former MEP friends. Although you wouldn't know it looking at the British media because there was one speech this week by a German MEP called Theresa Reinke that got the mainstream media into a complete froth. James O'Brien thought Christmas had come early <coughs> It trended all day because she was slagging off Boris. She was saying Brexit is a disaster. And they, all the FBP nut jobs, they, they, were, they were going mad for it. They're going, yeah, that's the kind of MEP we want. And you know what I said? Thank God we left. Yeah. Because we don't want these German bureaucrats poking their snouts in our business. But there were some great Eurosceptic moments this week. Belinda De Lucy with a quick roundup. Can we start with um, a curious looking fellow? a great supporter of the Brexit party, a certain Gunnar Beck, a German MEP, gave a great speech this week where he laid into EU bigwigs. Yes, I mean, Gunnar is one of my favourites throughout our time um, in the parliament. He was always very supportive. He's very academic, very clever. In fact, while I was doing my dissertation um, in EU law, um, I, I concentrated on his books. He's, he's an author, a brilliant author on how the ECJ is the motor for integration behind the scenes um, and is a very biased court. Um, no, he's brilliant. And uh, this week in Parliament, he stood up and he accused von der Leyen of Merkel of uh, lacking the ability to compromise in the negotiations. Um, and, and he's absolutely right. But of course, we never see any criticisms from the EU in speech is aired on mainstream media. Um, uh, Gunnar uh, stood up and said that. Then we had um, Jak Madison, who is uh, an e Estonian MEP. Um, he stood up in Parliament and he said the EU was going to suffer far more with a no deal than the UK. Um, we had Dirk Jan. Jan, a, a Dutch MEP who stood up and talked to Barnier directly, um, telling him that he had to compromise on fish. Um, and it was a very funny speech, actually, because um, Guy Verhofstadt, one of our, our favourite villains, um, mm. <laughs> stood up and, uh, and mocked uh, Dirk for supporting UK uh, relations and negotiations by saying, you know, the last time um, Holland negotiated with the British, uh, they lost New, New Amsterdam to the UK um, all that time ago when it became New York. Um, and, you know, people, are, MEPs are often mocked and criticised standing up and um, uh, questioning the EU during these negotiations. As we know, we were called fascists and far right all the time. Well, our friends, our MEP friends still get called that for sticking up for the UK in these negotiations. Um, and we had the fantastic 
Finnish MEP, Laura Hutiseri, who stood up and, and I don't know if our viewers have listened to the speech. Um, I urge you to Google it if you haven't. But she stood up this week in Parliament and she said, I have a dream. My dream is that the other EU member states do a Brexit. Um, she then continued by uh, repeating a comment that one of the European presidents had made um, where he said that uh, if Brexit was successful, um, then it would be the end of the European project. And she said this revealed the agenda, the, the intentions of the EU during these negotiations. And she and, ended and that's why they will never budge in their negotiating stance. They've got no incentive to budge. Uh, absolutely. Sorry, yeah. uh, uh, no, not at all. You're quite right, yeah. Ben. And what's really important is because of the political interest of the EU wanting uh, Brexit to be a failure and, and hoping that we don't benefit economically from Brexit, it's really important they keep their paws off our laws. <laughs> right, right. They, do, they do not have good intentions with the UK. Um, and yes, she ended her speech brilliantly saying, urging Boris to take the opportunity that he now has in his grasp to take back UK sovereignty. And he has it. There is nothing stopping Boris from taking back UK sovereignty. He has an 80 seat majority in Parliament. There is no need to give away um, our laws, to give control over to the EU over and above what a normal trade deal requires. So if he does sign away, our sovereignty, it will be on him, it will be on the Tories. And, and I'm always an optimist. I still hope and pray that I am wrong and that Boris pulls out a complete blinder of Brexit. Um, so I have my fingers crossed, but it was a really good week for pro-Brexit, pro-UK speeches in the EU Parliament, though you'd never know it with Sky and BBC. Belinda, a fabulous round of, and I'm sorry to have to say it, Ben, I'm afraid I want her back in the studio next week. She, she's a bit, yeah, she's good. What, she's easier on the eye than I am? No, she's not. <laughs> Look, to do with looks. You can't get sexist. She's, she's informed, beautiful. Look, and it's really, really important to, to keep hammering this point home, that we were not you know, isolated Eurosceptics. I mean, they stuck us at the back. But that didn't do much good, did it? We made just made no. more noise. We made a heck of a lot of noise from the back. But, but, when, but when, we, um, when we voted, and when we left and when we walked out, you, we, we will all recall, uh, we got a huge standing ovation from one side of the chamber. And the rest of them were, were making hand signals, but I don't think it was, <laughs> I don't think it was a wave. Um, but they, they, we, we had a lot of friends. In that, and there in are, that there chamber. are a lot of Eurosceptics in there. I, yeah. I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think that before we left, there were 217 yeah. NEP Eurosceptics. Yeah. You know, that's a lot out of 750. Yeah, and, and there's a huge interest in these sort of stories. Um, we did a Eurosceptic special on Unlocked a few weeks ago on the Express Facebook page. It had half a million views, half a million people, you know, are really, really interested in watching the European Union fall apart. And why not? It's a great thing yeah. to watch. It's a great thing to fan the flames of. And I think one of our legacies uh, of the Brexit movement will be, will be to encourage similar uprisings across the continent and i think that's a joyous thing i really read really it is and actually I, I, I don't wish to feel june's thunder but if we do successfully take back our fishing that's really bad for france mm. and macron will be under real pressure and that will fuel the fames of frexit yeah yeah well that was almost the perfect segue now uh so gin and tonic you got on the go there is it june it's water you're still muted darling Oh yeah. There you go. Look, June. It's been a it's been a really really busy week for fishing. It's kicking off with the French. Ben's mentioned Macron already. Um, there's been all sorts going on with Ireland, the French, the Belgians, the Danes, and the Dutch joining up behind the scenes, trying to force Boris into a U-turn. The Channel Islands are kicking off. Um, there's it's all happening with fishing. June all along, we knew fishing was a massive massive deal we knew it was a red line for brexit and things haven't changed have they june but where are we at how confident are you feeling and basically go bananas june i'm not confident you know i sat with defra on wednesday discussing fishing and they uh, there is no mention of reinstating margaret thatcher's 1988 merchant shipping act that has to happen Flagships, which are vessels on a British register, 
however, they are primarily owned by foreign interests, hold 54% of our quota, of UK quota. Now, unless these people are domicile in this country, that's live here, kids go to school here and pay tax, because none of that money goes into the treasury. Until that happened, we haven't taken back full control. You know, the, the great British public, they assume once you take back control of the waters, that automatically we have the fish and happy days, we get on rebuilding coastal communities. It's not about that. So I am not happy with that at all. And I do keep banging on about these coastal MPs. I mean, they, they were elected to do a job. I don't, my MP where I live, he's not, he's not bad because obviously I'm here biting at the bit with him all the time. But where are they all? Do, 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 have they really put party before the people they represent? I mean, is that what they have become? Because they should be ashamed of themselves if that is what they, their game is. There was one, Andrea Jenkins, she stood up this week and, and spoke up for fishing. And I look for these people and I, where are they? I'm, I'm hurt, I'm upset, and I'm worried for coastal communities that are deprived. There's social problems, there's loneliness, alcoholism, drug abuse, various dreadful things that go on in, in these deprived areas that people just do not know about. They need to get off their backsides, Martin, and look at what they're doing for the, their constituencies. As simple as that. Because I can tell you this, for one thing, the people that follow me, and there's some wonderful people out there, in, I mean, in this country, I can't believe how wonderful they are. They are behind us on this. They really do realise that, that unless we take back full control, we will never rebuild coastal communities. You know, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's wind, aggregates, whatever it is, what country would give away their ocean? I, 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 I just can't fathom it out. I just can't think in my wildest dreams what government would do that. And, you know, I just, do you know what? I bought this book a couple of years ago. Can you see it, guys? Yeah. Now, look at that. Now, my prime minister wrote that. Look at it. How one man made history. Well, that man was greatness. And I just hope my prime minister isn't a, a, is a great man, is a prime minister of weakness. That's what's worrying me. Now he ought to take that to bed with him tonight, <laughs> and read it, and because I have, and I loved it. Now there he is, and I want him to be him. So, you know, I'm worried, I'm worried sick, and, and you know, all I can say is the great British public, I know you're behind us, and I, and I need you more than ever. And, you know, I get quite emotional. I can feel myself tearing up here. You know, I, day in, day out, that's all I do is work with, with, not, with, with fishermen. We've not got a huge team. You know, we're all trying to make a living as well. And, no, I'm, I'm really getting upset about it all. And, and I really don't know what to... I'm, I'm, in, I'm despaired. I mean, it's awful. So, yeah. You know, June, every time you come on this show, um, I find myself getting choked. I feel... I feel choked up now. Jesus. Yeah, well, it's awful. You know, I, and lots of commentators, yeah. particularly Remainers, go on about how little the fishing industry is worth to the UK economy. But actually, for these 186 coastal communities to which you've been referring, that's 100% of their GDP. Mm. And actually, it could reinvigorate those communities if it was taken back properly. You'd get processing plants, shipbuilding going on. Um, you'd have hospitality sector coming up on the back of it distribution centers, there'd be a huge resurgence of economic activity automatically on taking back the fishing. And it would also fulfill, in one fell swoop, Boris's promise yeah. to level up the country. It would. You know, and you know, I said to you before, June, you know, like my dad was a coal miner and I see fishing as that same thing. And we, couldn't, you do. We, yeah. we couldn't save the pits. We can't bring the pits back now because it's bloody yeah. green deal. Um, there's no chance, even though we should be more energy self-reliant, that's a separate topic, but we can save the coastal communities. We can. We, we, can. Can, we can still intervene. Yes, we, can. we can. Think about what they could yeah. be, not what they are. All this, oh, it's only 0.1% of the GDP, but what could it be, the potential to unlock those industries yeah. and unlock those communities? 
give those communities purpose and hope and a reason to live. And it wouldn't, and, and, and by, sorry, sorry to go on about this, but it, it wouldn't just take back their share of the fission. It would be a multiplier effect on our economy. It would go from 0.1 to potentially three or 4% of GDP. It yes. would be a dramatic improvement. And I mean, I remember as a child, yeah, I remember as a child loving going to Hastings, loving going to Eastbourne, because it was so much fun. You'd have your fish and chips in a, in a bit of newspaper and you'd walk down the pier and the, everything was alive. And now these communities are basically dead. And it's because the fish have gone. And not only, not only that, but they became dumping grounds for social problems from London. There was a terrible part of, of London mayoral policy where they were dumping drug addicts to places like Hastings because the housing stock was cheaper and selling off public housing to, 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 for the coffers. So, and so those communities were inheriting social problems. They were exported from London. Those communities have been betrayed so many times, June, and you just keep fighting and you're an inspiration. You should be. Why don't you stand as an MP? God, we've got to get you elected. Well, the way things are now, you know, I, 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 if any if any seat come up now in any coastal community, I'd move house. Someone's got to go in. Someone's got to stand up in, in Parliament and, and, and speak for these coastal communities. You know, like Ben said, one job at sea is eight on land. It's just a, it's as simple as that. You know, I've written the report brief. I presented that in Westminster last October. I handed over the rebuild to our government. They have that. I mean, what more do they want? I've offered them my time free of charge. I don't want anything for it. I will bring my team and we will write, I've written strategies. They'll, they've taken some of those strategies, but they're not putting them in and they're not implementing them. I mean, if they were, if they were serious about Brexit, June, you would now have thrown at you grants for building boats, grants for building factories, yeah loan schemes at discounted rates to do yeah, all of that. Yeah, uh, apprenticeship set up for fishermen, apprenticeship set up for processing. You'd have the government all over these communities. Yeah. They're not serious about taking back fishing. And this comes back to the whole introduction that we had mm. about are we going to get a proper Brexit yeah, or I not? Don't, excuse me. I don't think this, you know, when you say they're not serious, no, they're not. But I really, truly don't think they know how to. I don't think they know how to rebuild things. They've been so reliant on the EU, they don't know how to run a business. They don't know how to build an industry because they haven't had to do that. Because, but, so if you do, I mean, I don't like painting and decorating, you know, so if I don't know how to do it, what do I do? I ring up and get the decorators in. You know, it's get people to come and, and, and get people to come and, and pull these people in to help. They do not want to know, they couldn't care less. And it's interesting, you know, if, if, if you go to places like Lower Stock, you know, and you look around, um, you, bec you're, you become a Brexiteer overnight because it's, it's so self-evident and abundantly clear that these communities have been abandoned and left to rot. And I absolutely agree with you, Ben. If this government was serious about this, they'd have a plan in place now about rebuilding these industries. And who, what honest taxpaying decent Britain wouldn't want that. Absolutely. And June would be punching the air with, with, mm. with gladness. Mm. Mm. But as it is, she's holding her head in her hands along with all her, uh, uh, her fellow fishermen, um, you know, just bemoaning the fact that this government hasn't got the courage to do the right thing by, by the United Kingdom. Well, we've got to keep up the pressure now. David, I've seen you kind of nodding furiously in the background there um, dur during this um, little conversation about fishing. Anything you want to add to the debate there, Captain? Well, do you know, it's really interesting listen to, listening to June because a lot of the issues and problems that she faces are very similar to, to what I've seen and experienced. Uh, a lot, some of the decision makers are just deaf to the detail. And um, when you try to explain consequences to jobs, for instance, it should be an easy one to, to put across to MPs and decision makers. Uh, but th then a few weeks later or, or sometime later you find out they've taken absolutely no notice so yeah i recognize a lot of that good so june uh, one final thing that's been talked about in fishing this week we talked about it on the previous episode where you kindly came on and that is this three-year tapered down deal so that basically keeps things as they are with the with the other european countries now and then we gradually see those quotas declining um, you said before you wouldn't accept that. 
but it's looking like it might be more likely. What are your thoughts on that, June? Well, another three years, I don't think there'll be much fishing left in the UK. You know, we have the fishermen have no fish to catch. Markets aren't good. You know, I, I, I'm in Lowestoft. I've got the fish auctioneers in Lowestoft. There's days I don't have any fish. I, you know, we'll all try and hang on another three years, but that's not acceptable. And if Boris thinks he's going to sugarcoat this and make it sound, oh, this three, I go back to, to, to what I just said. That three years, they, they're not ready, Martin. They have no idea. I work with DEFRA. They're clueless. They, uh, they, haven't, they don't know how to rebuild it. They, I'm sure they think, oh, this three years will give them time. And would you put your country, just because you haven't, you haven't done the work and put the graft in for the last four years, they're a disgrace. We knew we were leaving. Four years ago, they should have started, started to do the rounds. But, but, but I, know, I know processors, fishermen, no one's even been to see us. We wrote the reef report, which I delivered in Westminster. In that, that shows you how you rebuild. People say, well, we haven't got the boats. We have got the boats. We've got, we're ready. The industry is ready. Uh, I sell fish. I'm ready. I'll be able to sell my fish all over the world. I ain't got a problem with that. Don't worry about us. Worry about government. They are not ready. So the three years, I don't think there'll be much of an industry left. And then what happens after three years? So after three years, all of a sudden, um, I'll, we'll, have, we'll be sitting, waiting for another election. Will Labour get in? And then will Labour put us back in? I mean, what is going on? I mean, you can't make this, this kind of thing up. I mean, I was an MEP for eight months and it's not rocket science, this job. They've got people who work for them. You want something done. You want, you, you want some research on something. There's someone sitting in your office. How many staff have they all got? Six or seven staff each? Mm. I mean, it's a shambles. They're a disgrace. And I, and I would I, I, I still go back to the 186 coastal MPs, wherever they are. Get out of your hole and get on with some hard work. Roll your sleeves up and start doing what you're paid to do. And that is rebuild your coastal towns and villages, Martin. Well, June, as ever, an inspiration. And I don't know about you, Ben, but I would not want to get on the wrong side of June memory. No, I certainly <laughs> would not. <laughs> I'd expect a fish grab yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, June, you've got to laugh. You, you, you've got to keep smiling, hey, because you know, these, these are serious times. We're approaching the end game. We've, got, we've had so much emotional investment in this journey. Mm. June memory, you more than anyone, I think. And, and I know... I was with you. We were side by side with you in, in that chamber when we pressed that button to vote for this, this deal. And we put the faith in Boris. That faith seems tested at the moment, Ben. It absolutely does. And um, I mean, it's not we're at the 11th hour and perhaps 50th minute. He's got 10 minutes to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Mm. And like Belinda said, you know, I've got everything crossed, hoping that I'm wrong. But I suspect I'm right. Fabulous. Okay, now please stick around. And by the way, anybody, if you're watching this and you're enjoying it, pump it around Facebook, share it with your mates. We're new, we're the new kids in the block. We're fearless. We have the debates that the mainstream media are too scared to go near. This kind of stuff you don't hear every day. Um, we're here to serve you and we're here not to kind of mind our P's and Q's, although well done, June, you managed to get through all of that without using expletive. That takes some doing. Believe me, I've seen this woman after a couple of GNTs. Let's move swiftly onwards. And next topic up today is another massive, massive area of concern that didn't really get talked about enough, I think, throughout the whole European project. And we're bringing in David Banks now to talk about this, former defence advisor to the Conservative Party, as I said, and a senior figure at veterans for Britain, and that is the European Union Army. Now, do you remember in 2017, Nick Clegg called it a dangerous fantasy, but Guy Verhofstadt had already been ranting about standing up to Putin and protecting borders the year before. In her opening speech, Ursula von der Leyen, we heard it, we were all sat there. She absolutely said, the world needs more Europe and we plan to expand the European Defence Union. She was then voted in, although she was the only person on the ticket. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. And, and by the way, later that week, 
somebody else was voted in on a ticket of one somewhere else in the world. Does anybody know who that was? Uh, no. Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Kim Jong-un was voted in as the dictator, the president. Call him what you want, but don't call the wrong, the wrong thing or your head might fall off. He got, he got voted in on a ticket of one, the same as Ursula von der Leyen. I digress. The European Union army is a project that was laden with costs, hugely um, breeding dependency um, onto the European Union, which you're in. How do you get out? Ben, we were talking about it all the way along. And it didn't seem to get much cut through in the press. David, thank God we escaped that one, hey? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's big. And a lot of EU countries don't know what they're in mm. uh, because they haven't paid any attention to it either. Mm. And it's funny because in, in terms of the, the costings, I mean, there are some eye-watering numbers that we were reading about if you want to get signed up to this. Uh, what kind of expenditure might we have been looking at as a member state? As a member state, probably something between 8 and 10 billion. But that's not the end of the story because what we would have been paying in uh, is, is to what is really clear cut in terms of the budgetary pillars of the EU. But where they really wield power is in the political structures. And then they have their puppet strings on the member states' budgets, and that would have included the UK. Mm. But there's still a few risks for the UK uh, as in the current time, uh, because we might not be completely uh, uh, shot of it even now. So what you're saying that even if we have a Brexit, we will still have the tendrils of the European Union involved? Well, there's, yes. Yeah, because there's two ways in which we could find ourselves trapped in a really uncomfortable uh, circumstances. One is that the political declaration mentions three EU defence structures, and there's been no clear statement from ministers to say that we're not going to be in these. It's, at the moment, it's, it's merely an option. And the other risk, or it's actually more than a risk at the moment, uh, is that there is an EU law which we're going to be keeping, which will continue to do harm to UK shipbuilding and defence industry. Mm. And that is definitely a problem, and it needs to be addressed as soon as possible by MPs, so that on the 1st of January, we can go into WTO rules, which are far more beneficial for UK industry and shipbuilding. Okay, so another thing that, that always struck me as fascinating, because I used to sit between Ben Habib and James Glancy. James Glancy, of course, a decorated serviceman. And it, I had a fascinating conversation with him about um, part of the reason that the European Union wants military um, unification across um, the member states is in terms of supply chains. So quite simply, at the moment, the French, the Belgians, um, the Spanish, whatever, have different these different tanks, different ships, different firearms. But if they're all standardised, then you become reliant upon the, the 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 supply chain of the EU. QED buying into the military project makes you dependent on the European Union for your military protection. Absolutely. And um, have you noticed that whatever the EU does politically? it always shrouds it with an economic argument. Mm. And so where they're integrating the militaries of the EU, you, you'd never believe it if you followed the mainstream UK media, but that's what's happening. The, the way that they're going about that is to integrate a defence industry and to give uh, cheap promises of cash here and there to um, member state defence ministries. So they put the economic argument first and say, well, by the way, did you realise you have to sign up your defence policy at the same time, but they, they make it look like cooperation rather than integration. And, do you and we think, would have... Mm. Do, do you think it's fair, it's a fair statement to make that, that actually this is a power grab on two fronts? First of all, is the European army meant to be a soft kind of way of replacing NATO? I do think that, yes. And there are more than 20 areas in which the EU has duplicated NATO in the structures that it's created just since the referendum. Mm. And I'm talking about uh, strategic airlift capability, new budgets, uh, science and technology, 
command chain. They've got their own uh, HQ now called the MPCC based in Brussels. So yeah, definitely. And why is NATO and the US not kicking off about this? Well, they, they do a little bit, but then that's followed by really quick reassurances that they've got nothing to worry about. And there's a bit of a diplomatic drive takes place to quell those fears, but they should be saying more. But one of the reasons why they don't, uh, why, why NATO and the US don't um, complain more about the EU's duplication of NATO is that um, it's difficult for people to understand it because who's really followed all these things week in, week out, because it's a drip, drip. As, as ever with the EU, it's incrementalism. I mean, I, I, I sat on the budgetary committee, you know, one of the privileges I had as an MEP, and uh, we got the papers, the first draft papers for the next seven year multi-financial framework budget. And I remember my hair on the back of my neck rising when I saw that there was 23 billion euros ascribed to weapons development by the European Union. Yes and 10 billion euros for the development of a 10,000 strong EU badged, so not member state badged, but EU badged border force. Mm. Make of that what you will, but that is, uh, I mean, David's obviously absolutely right. They're gonna try and capture our military through PESCO, which is their alternative to NATO, but they're, they're actually developing an own active army. That, mm. I mean, perhaps you'd like to just comment a bit on that, David. Yeah. Um... In a sentence, the way that EU integration works is that it's a number of layered platforms of integration. So permanent structure cooperation, PESCO, encourages the EU member states to do more together and to create sort of central pillars of their um, military capabilities. Uh, for instance, a, a central medical team, uh, command chain and uh, uh, energy capability uh, new tanks together, so they're operating and uh, buying these things together, and even combined military units. Um, and what they always do is deny that it's an EU army. Well, at some point, they're going to have to come clean. Mm. And we will see that in the next few years, I'm sure, because uh, it's already rolling on so, so rapidly. But because they deny it, it's essential for us uh, trying to highlight these problems to use the same kind of wording that they do and say, OK, if you don't want to call it EU army, uh, let's pick up on all the times that you've called it integration, all the times where you've spelled out in clear terms that this is going to be uh, uh, a single military enterprise of the EU, a unitary armed forces. And um, we're well away down the line of that already. So um, permanent structured cooperation is now already a couple of years old. Uh, there's more than 40 projects involved in it. Um, yeah, thank goodness we're not in it at the moment, but let's be um, cautious and make sure that, that that which is in the exit arrangements doesn't get sealed into to what we do um, with, with the future partnership. You know, there is still though this, this, this collective sense of myopia and amnesia about this, I will never forget. It was utterly, utterly incredible. Uh, we listened to von der Leyen give her a speech where she actively and you know, specifically said, we, we needed a European Defence Force. I went outside the chamber, ITV News were there, they grabbed me and they said, what's your reaction to that, Martin? I said, they want a European army, she just said it. And the Liberal Democrat MEPs from Britain were heckling me, going rubbish, rubbish. I went, which part of that didn't you hear? <laughs> what, what is this this, yeah. this sense of, of delusion that it isn't about building a military force that can take over uh, Europe? How badly might that well, end? They want to be a supranational state. Of course they do. But I, I just want to bring it back again to the Conservatives. Forgive me, David. But, you know, it was Boris Johnson, who was Foreign Secretary, signed us in to the European Defence Union after the vote for Brexit in 2016. Theresa May's government signed us up in, I think, September 2017. Correct me if I'm wrong, David. Uh, th there was one element of it in September 2017, but it, it had been going on for almost a year before that as well in about six other EU Council agreements. Mm. There you go. So, so we, we were stitched like a kipper from the start. Like, I, I think it's something that's not talked about enough. 
Um, I, I do think as well that it's, it's about the expansion of the EU itself, but we know they want to move into the Balkan states. They want those people in. They are, they are states that will want a European army because who's breathing down, down their neck yeah. over the Russian border? And I think that's another thing. Um, having an EU army is very appealing to the Balkans. You know, and so it will think, oh, yeah, we, we, yeah. If, if we join them, we get a free army to protect from Vladimir Putin. Yeah. It's a I mean, power grab. I think the only redeeming feature of this entire discussion is that the European armies collectively are pretty damn hopeless at the moment. <laughs> and they need the United Kingdom badly, which is why we must escape. But what I'm going to do quickly before we go, we do it every week. I want to see if you've got a message for Boris Johnson. The clock is ticking to midnight on the Brexometer. Ben Habib, first to you. Message for Boris Johnson. My message for Boris Johnson is he made a contract with the British people to take back control of our laws, our borders, our cash and our fish, that the United Kingdom would leave the EU whole and intact. That is a much more important contract than the withdrawal agreement. He needs to choose between the British people and the European Union. And he needs to ditch the withdrawal agreement. Belinda, what's your message for Boris Johnson up for you? I would say, Boris, stop worrying about bad headlines. Stop allowing them to shape your policy. Stop worrying about polls. The freedom of our country, our sovereignty, our ability to make our own laws in the best interests of our people is at stake. If you miss this opportunity, you will be a heath not a Churchill. It is your time, this one moment in history, to get a backbone and say to the EU, get your paws off our laws. I like that. I like that. I think you've been hanging around with me too long. A little bit of that tabloid humour is rubbing off on you there, Belinda. Beautiful. <laughs> June Mummery, message for Boris Johnson. My message is quite simple to Boris. Please, Prime Minister, do not betray the fishing industry. Do not betray coastal communities that are deprived and need you. It's as simple as that, Martin. Drew Munray, powerfully put, as ever, final word of the show, David Banks' message for the Prime Minister. You can be as rude as you want. Uh, I won't be rude, uh, but there's, there's four quick things. First of all, he needs to look at polls from last week, which showed that he had a sudden jump when he told the EU to stick it, and he was five points ahead. Yeah. Also, he'll know all about Winston Churchill, who said you can't negotiate with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. And that's kind of what we're facing with the EU. Uh, number three, shipbuilding. Uh, he's not he maybe personally, but his government is going to be selling out shipbuilding if, if we don't change retained EU law on defence industrial contract uh, law in uh, defence procurement. And fourthly, make a really clear statement which is months overdue, that we're not gonna be getting into the defense arrangements in the political declaration. It's just so simple, but it hasn't been done. Okay, beautiful round of comments. I would like to send my message and it's this, you know, we've been patient, we've been subservient. We did what we were told with the lockdown. We're waiting for action now on Brexit. Don't let the country down, but you must not disrespect our veterans like this on Remembrance Day. I think it's completely unacceptable. I really, really do. I think we have to do something about this. If you agree, get involved. Hashtag Remembrance Unlocked. Can we unlock Remembrance Day this year? Can we all get together? Can we just rally around and get people involved and try and do something to show that we care and we're thankful for the ultimate sacrifice? I'm getting all emotional. It's not, it's not on. Right. Sorry, guys. This is live TV. Even, even, even people, like, even people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wait till this show is over. Look, I'm going to wrap up with that. I don't want to. I don't have a heart attack. Thank you for joining us, guests today. Belinda, June, David, Ben. It's been brilliant. If you've been watching out there and you like what we do, please subscribe, share, join in, tell all your friends, get involved. What do you want us to talk about next time? What do you want to see? unlocked in Britain. There's lots and lots of topics we need to talk about. The economy, Brexit, fishing, Remembrance Day. There's an endless list. We've got to make nuisances of ourselves. We've been unlocked. The channel that talks common sense and speaks Britain's language. Thanks for watching and see you again next week. Thank you.